Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, national civil rights leader Reverend William Barber on how to get poverty into political campaigns. Poverty is a central issue. It is an issue that crosses the lines of race and color and sexuality. Plus, as the state looks to cannabis, we look ahead to a new podcast that explores the issues around legalization. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. It's a great conversation correspondent Russ Contreras has with Reverend Barber. That's later in the show. Laura Pascas also checks in on the strange die-off of migratory birds in New Mexico. The line is here, of course, to opine on the long road to decisions about what to do with controversial statues and monuments. They'll also look at schools tiptoeing into the new school year as they try to keep kids educated while also keeping them and everyone around them healthy. That's where we'll start. There's little debate that kids are better off learning in the classroom than at home situation where our parent can only pay part-time attention to their learning. Now, parents across the state have scrambled to create space in the day and in their home where kids can learn. But when is it safe for kids, teachers, and support staff to get back in the classroom? That's where we will start with the Line Opinion Panel this week. We welcome frequent guest Julianne Grimm. She is editor and publisher of the Santa Fe Reporter. We're also joined by Line regular and attorney Laura Sanchez. And another regular is with us this week, and that would be Tom Garrity of the Garrity Group PR. Tom, let me start with you. There are so many people who have a stake in getting this right, and, and I'm, I'm just curious right off the top, what are you hearing about how schools and parents are approaching this? Well, it, it all depends uh, which schools or parents you're referring to. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are uh, you know, a single parent with two kids, one in elementary school, the other in junior high, uh, this whole time is very trying because there's not a whole lot of school support, especially if you're in Albuquerque, uh, to you know help you to look after uh, you know your work work that you have to do, and then also being a teacher to an elementary school and a mid schooler. Mm -hmm. um, if you are if you have the luxury of uh, of having a you know having a uh, additional support in the home, uh, then, you know, it's, uh, you're feeling a little bit better. Uh, but if you are uh, someone who also has access to, you know, like Rio Rancho Public Schools, uh, where you actually have a staggered schedule in place, it mm -hmm. kind of provides and takes the heat off uh, for parents who are trying to juggle so many different things and kids who are, quite frankly, just looking forward to getting out of the house and trying to re-socialize with their friends in a very safe way. So to answer your question, it really depends what school district you're in, what you're, you know, what stage in life your children are mm -hmm. uh, it, it, that I think really provides that lens for uh, parents in the community to see how it's working out for them. That's a good point there, that last point you just said there. And Julianne, let me turn this to you. Uh, the governor's made no bones about it. She'd like to move from the youngest to the oldest when it comes to getting kids back in class. And not to say that these kids are, are they're not an experiment, but they are, are, they're sort of a, a let's see how this works kind of a thing. Uh, what, what's your sense of it? How, again, picking up where Tom was on how parents should be embracing this opportunity or not, because we do have some doing, of course, still, you know, a hybrid model. So what do you think about getting back in class now? Yeah, I mean, not everyone has the same choice. Uh, Tom's right. It depends on where you mm -hmm. live and which school district your children are enrolled in. So um, many of the large school districts in the state, including Santa Fe, um, are not back to school at a hybrid model for elementary school students, even though the state has said students in K through five can go back to school if the districts meet the criteria and the public education department approves their plan for reopening. Mm -hmm. So there are, you know, 20 districts um, that are trying that out. You know, Tom mentioned uh, Rio Rancho. Socorro is another place where they have open elementary schools. And then we also got news this week. It's our first week of reporting on school related COVID-19 cases. So the public education department um, reported three cases. Um, and I think, you know, as we see more schools open, of course, we're going to see more cases. And the, the question is really going to be whether those cases kind of stay within an acceptable level and whether there's anything that can be described as an outbreak um, in the schools. That's, of course, what the health um, and education officials are really 
trying to fight against. Mm -hmm. um, though in Santa Fe, there's a school board meeting tonight. We're recording on Thursday, um, and there's nothing on the agenda about this topic in particular. The union and the school district made an agreement to uh, do distance learning all the way through the first nine weeks of school. Mm -hmm. So for us, that looks like the end of October. Okay. Interesting point there. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, Laura, when you think about the size of the Rio Rancho School District, I, I can't help but wonder that other, it's a pretty big district and has a, a pretty decent reputation as a matter of fact as well, but I can't help but think some of the larger school districts are watching this situation closely. Do you get that same sense? I do. I really think that um, Rio Rancho is going to be a bit of a bellwether for the rest of the state. We're really going to be looking at what they're doing and trying to um, see how it works or how it doesn't work, mm -hmm. see if the hybrid learning um, is effective. I think a lot of or a lot of both teachers and parents, but parents in particular, um, we saw some news stories this week about parents being relieved to, to see their students back. Um, it gives them a sense of normalcy for the children. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of kids out there are just wanting to get back to school to see their friends and to be able to socialize a little bit more. I think they feel very isolated and we're seeing incidents of, of depression where there wouldn't be normally. And so I think that, um, that everybody's gonna be looking at Rio Rancho to see how well that uh, that works or doesn't. And then hopefully we can uh, replicate the results, the better results across the state. Mm -hmm. Tom, interestingly, when you think about it, APS, uh, Julian mentioned that the next nine weeks for, for uh, Santa Fe, APS is online for the rest of the semester. And I'm, I'm just curious, and Las Cruces, by the way, voted to do the same uh, uh, this week. And local control is the issue. You heard that a lot about in this run up to this whole situation. And now we have it, basically. We're seeing school districts use local control and making local decisions. If this is, the, is this the way it's supposed to be right now? Is this where, where folks feel comfortable about their school decisions? It is. Uh, you know, I think that this, you know, we, we are seeing the local control play out. Uh, whether or not we're seeing the same kind of, uh, of local engagement, uh, you know, taking place is a whole other issue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of, the th one of the reasons I think San that uh, we see Rio Rancho is being very successful in doing its implementation are two reasons. One is it's a smaller school district compared to Las Cruces and Albuquerque. And two is that they have consistent leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Sue Cleveland has been in that position for 20 plus years, which is a great thing because it really kind of sets, uh, sets that mark as far as what's the communication level, what's the trust, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Know, how what's the standard operating procedure and what are the what ifs so you know she's able to address a lot of that because she's had a long time communication long time uh, presence in the district however you get to larger districts with albuquerque and you just don't have that same level of consistency right. uh you know regardless if the school is in the northeast heights south valley west side everybody has their own way of doing things to communicate within that school community my concern is, is whether or not those communications at the school level are making it up to the district and specifically to the school board, uh, because you have some school board members, most of them, except for the one on the west side, who say, no, we got to you know, shut things down for now. But you have the lone west side school board member uh, who's saying, you know what, uh, we need to you know, really go back to go to a hybrid model. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you mentioning that too, by the way. This, this is very tricky here in the APS world. Uh, Laura, college, got to get college in here. We're all seeing the headlines from around the country about students doing all kinds of crazy things that students do, you know, when it comes to COVID and all that kind of thing. How should, you know, if we have an outbreak at State or at Eastern or at UNM or wherever, Santa Fe Community College, it doesn't matter. What does that do to the tone about how people should feel about sending kids back to school at college age? Well, I think what we're seeing across the country is students, um, it, really, it really reminds us of um, the lack of good judgment among students <laughs> or, or you know, uh, adults that age that um, they're just not exercising the same level of, uh, of good judgments that we are hoping that everybody exercises during this difficult time. So I think that we, if we see an outbreak like this in one of our schools, we're gonna see a lot of tension probably the governor reacting um, to that and, and starting to really tighten down everything again. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anybody wants that. We're seeing some improvements and we're starting to see some uh, businesses open back up and, um, and having more capacity. And that's always good for the economy. Um, but I also think that it's regional because, um, you know, I, had, I spent some time down in, in Roswell uh, this past weekend 
And, uh, and I know that there was frustration in that area. They've seen a spike in Chavez County in that whole southeastern um, corner. And they're, uh, as a result, are seeing um, their school boards uh, not, you know, basically they're, they're not coming back to school. But in addition to that, there's also not sports. And so in particular, I was hearing from folks that have students in the Artesia School District where sports is a huge, huge deal. That's right. A lot of good athletes that come out of that um, school districts. And they're really um, concerned about being able to see a college, um, to be able to get a college scholarship uh, for some of those seniors. These are so, real, yeah, these are real problems for them. You know, it, very, it's, very big problems. Yeah. So yeah, it is regional. Exactly right. We're out of time on that for now. This group is back in a few minutes to talk about this, talk about statues and monuments. It's only been three months since they were headline news. Now, what's happened since? We'll dig in. Last weekend, Algernon Damasa at the Las Cruces Sun News broke a story that people were finding dead migratory birds across the state of New Mexico. To find out what might be happening, correspondent Laura Pascas checked in with New Mexico State University ornithologist Martha Desmond and Audubon, New Mexico's Jonathan Hayes. It's migration season for birds, but you're hearing and seeing some disturbing reports around the state. Can you describe for us what you've been finding out? Sure. Um, since actually now the 20th of August, 20th of August, we've been seeing reports of mortalities of birds around New Mexico. They started in South Central New Mexico at White Sands Missile Range. And folks there, Trish Cutler, who's a biologist, was sending out asking reports, asking if anyone else was seeing this. And the truth is we weren't. And we thought it was an isolated incident. We had a large weather event across the country a week ago. And that brought a lot of birds down this area. And it also brought in a lot of mortalities. We've seen a lot of birds that we don't normally see um, migrating through here. And we're seeing some very odd behaviors and a lot of dead birds. So what are some of the odd behaviors you're seeing and what are some of the species you're seeing affected? Sure. Um, the odd behaviors are things like birds that are normally in shrubs and trees are um, hopping around on the ground. We're finding birds like swallows, violet green swallows and barn swallows that are aerial insectivores sitting on the ground, very lethargic, clustering in um, old barn swallow nests and found dead in old barn swallow nests. Um, a bird like the Western wood peewee that we probably passes us over because honestly, we're not that great of a stopover site for them. Um, here, just tons of them. There, there's a lot of them and there've been, a lot of them were hit by cars. There are a lot of them in areas um, in ag fields and, um, and just kind of open areas and um, people's gardens. Um, so it's just, it's, it's just a very odd time. Honestly, um, the cold weather, um, has contributed to some of this, but this is something that's been going on and we're still getting reports of carcasses today. So I understand that you're still studying along with other biologists in the state, still studying and trying to figure out what might have happened. What are some of the ideas that people have right now? So certainly the cold weather contributed to some of this. Um, there are other thoughts, and again, these are just thoughts and ideas. We don't really understand completely what's going on. The um, fires in the West could have changed some migratory routes. Some birds might have some damage to their lungs because of smoke inhalation. It's been very dry here in New Mexico this year. So if birds had to change their patterns because of the fire, and then they ended up stopping over here and dropped down in the middle of the desert. There isn't enough food to sustain them to continue their journey. That may also be a factor. So, you know, those are the major things that we're looking at right now. So I know since this story broke, the, the, um, the, the public has responded to this issue, but I'm curious, you know, for, for somebody who might not care about birds or be paying close attention, why should people care that this is happening? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. And, you know, to me, this, this is our native biodiversity, biological diversity. It's like a museum. It's a national treasure. It's a heritage for our kids and our grandkids. And, you know, a lot of, you know, since 1970, we've lost 3 billion birds, an estimated 3 billion birds. And so a lot of these species are already at risk and they're already declining. And to have a major event like this on top of the declines that they're already experiencing 
is, uh, is devastating for some of these species. Well, Dr. Desmond, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you. John, have you yourself seen any of these mortalities or, um, you know, sort of experienced any strange bird stories this week? Yeah, after the initial reports came out, I went down to do my uh, you know, weekly bike ride along the Bosque Trail in, in Albuquerque. And uh, uh, I was surprised to encounter a number of uh, swallows along the trail. Actually, when I started my bike ride, there was a young child uh, sitting there staring at something, an object in the trail. I didn't know what it was. And I realized it was a, uh, a, a violet green swallow that was uh, exhausted and uh, looking dazed. And as I went down further down the trail, I started seeing them all along the trail and a number of them dead along the side of the trail. Um, you know, it's, we can talk about these things and you read reports, uh, but when you see it up close, it can be really impactful. So it was a pretty sad sight to see. Where were you seeing the worst die offs and what species were, were being found? The first reports we had were down in Southern New Mexico. And actually the first people that brought it to my attention were the biologists at, uh, at White Sands. Um, but shortly after that, we started getting reports from all over the state. So I don't think we right now think that there's necessarily a particular area uh, that uh, uh, that's focused on. It's, it's pretty widespread throughout New Mexico, but we are looking around to see if our partners in Arizona or Texas have seen the same thing. And, and so far they haven't. So it looks like it's limited to New Mexico. Uh, the bird species are mostly insect eating birds, uh, but we've seen uh, all types affected. Uh, uh, but the warblers, um, uh, we've had reports of bluebirds, flycatchers, uh, a number of those groups that, that spend a lot of time eating insects are the ones we're seeing most heavily impacted. So why is this time of year so important? Why are these migrations so significant? So it, as most folks know, you know, our, our bird populations, uh, you know, they winter in areas that are that provide the best overwintering forage and habitat. Uh, and they go to sunnier climates to uh, 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 do that. And uh, uh, they get away from their breeding grounds before the snow falls and before the weather turns uh, uh, rough. And so uh, it's pretty important for them to be able to have a smooth path from that breeding ground to the wintering ground. Uh, when you imagine the distances they fly over and how small those critters are, uh, you know, they are really, you know, running right on the edge of, of empty in their fuel tanks, if you, if you think of it that way. And uh, they're always just on the edge of survival because it's such an arduous journey and so tough. Uh, so any adverse conditions can really have a significant impact. So this is really the time where, where these birds are probably the most vulnerable to things like that. So with so many things happening in the world right now, John, why should people care about birds? Oh, uh, you know, Laura, I, I personally, I, I care about, um, uh, you know, all wild things and I'm, you know, a wildlife biologist. So it's, that's always been a tough question for me to answer because, uh, you know, I love seeing the birds fly. I love seeing the, uh, you know, deer and antelope and, and bear and, and all the wonderful things that we have here in New Mexico that we share this land with. Uh, but one of the things we try to convey to people is that if we do the right things for birds, if we're doing the right things for these habitats, uh, we're helping people, whether it's uh, water in the rivers, uh, you know, healthy forests that aren't on fire and aren't ablaze, um, you know, snow-capped peaks, all these things that we cherish and love and make our quality of life better. Uh, uh, depend, birds depend on those too. And so if we're helping birds, we're helping people uh, and the planet as a whole. If people do find um, lethargic birds or dead birds, what should they do? So uh, right now, uh, we actually, we've been coordinating with New Mexico Game and Fish to do some analysis and some necropsy. They actually have uh, all the specimens they need. So we're asking folks uh, to uh, not, not send in birds if they, if they find dead birds. Uh, honestly, you're, you're probably best off letting them lie and let nature take its course. If you find uh, uh, you know, an exhausted bird and you want to help, uh, you can look up uh, New Mexico Game and Fish. They have a database of uh, a certified wildlife rehabbers, and you can take a bird there. Um, one of the things we're asking folks to do, though, if they use the iNaturalist app, uh, there is a, uh, a, 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 a project down there for Southwest bird mortality, and they can actually report through that app uh, when they see big observations of, of a number of dead birds like this. But uh, for now, we're not, we're not asking folks to send in any more, any more specimens. All right, John Hayes, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Laura. Welcome back to The Line. Laura Paskus pointed out in her Our Land Weekly newsletter this week that many of us are overwhelmed 
by a deluge of bad news. It was just three months ago that statues and monuments across the country were being removed, sometimes by force. It can seem more like a lifetime ago, and now some people are asking questions about what's really happened to the statues that are either still there or were removed, pending some as yet unexplained plan for relocation. In Santa Fe, Mayor Alan Weber removed a statue of Don Diego de Vargas in June. He called it a, quote, a moment of moral clarity, end quote, back then. But Julianne, as your former colleague at the New Mexican, Daniel Chacon, pointed out, that moment has taken a little bit. Do you see meaningful action at City Hall on this quite yet? Yeah, you know, um, it, the Santa Fe reporter pointed that out, too, a few days before that story ran in the Santa Fe, New Mexican. Love the correction. Um, original people who pointed it out are those who advocated for removal of the obelisk and removal of some of the other monuments to um, the violence that exist in the Santa Fe community. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I like that you pointed out this idea that Mayor Weber uh, talked about moral clarity and how clear it was and how quickly he made a decision mm -hmm. um, three months ago. And he made made a promise. And he, in fact, took an action that some people think is pretty cowardly and that he ordered city workers to scoop up the statue of Don Diego de Vargas um, just as the sun was coming up. Right. And we learned, in fact, that earlier that night in the dead of night, uh, there were people working on the plaza trying to remove the obelisk from the plaza in the middle of the night. And we've gone from that drastic, quick action to three months later, nothing. You know, we've had promises of these commissions and, um, you know, kind of vague um, information from the city about problems with this plan. Mm -hmm. um, but the mayor's not granting interviews to explain this delay. Um, and, you know, it's let, let, really- let me, kind of Julianne, let me, ask, let me ask you about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that the mayor wants to start. What, what, what is that? What, what, what is he looking to do? Who makes it up? Is it a community dialogue? What? Nobody knows, huh? Oh, boy. <laughs> no, I mean, I, you know, I, I feel like we're, there were lots of things that were said three months ago, but right. to try to figure out what's happening based on those statements seems like a, a fool's errand at this point. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about what, uh, you know, is it a historic monument? Does it belong to the state? Does it belong to the city? You know, who owns the obelisk in particular? Right. Um, and, you know, I, I did a story back when I was on the beat at the Daily Paper about all the different things that have occupied that public space that we now know as the plaza that now holds the obelisk. And at one time there were um, crops growing there, living mm -hmm. things. And I'm of the opinion that that might be the best uh, way to go, to get something um, alive and uh, not politically loaded um, in that spot for the benefit of our city. Amazing. Yeah, I, I could imagine. That's an interesting idea. Hey, Tom, I got to ask you this. We've got some polling out from research and polling about how folks feel statewide about the removal of statues. And it was interesting. I mean, I, maybe to some, you know, 53 percent of us oppose moving the Oñate statues across New Mexico. What does this polling say to you when you see this? Uh, it says because it's the, you know, the polling is so close and I'm looking at it as well over here, here it is, is uh, it, it's so it's 53 percent is obviously a majority, but there's so many different areas uh, like the, the one item that jumps out to me is the regional breakdown in mm -hmm. northwest New Mexico, where you have 69 percent who oppose yep. changing names or you know, changing the status quo and 25% uh, uh, not. And knowing just that, you know, the diversity of Northwest New Mexico tells me that there's a lot of reconciliation and discussion that needs to take place in Northwest New Mexico. Mm. And even Brian Sandroff said that there was an underrepresentation of Native Americans uh, due to uh, the lack of a you know, voting profile uh, amongst, amongst that group. So, right. you know, I, I think that there's, it's, it gives us a snapshot that says, there's a lot more conversation that needs to take place. And it's always great to hear Julianne's uh, uh, take on Santa Fe. I just, it's, to me, it's always a breath of fresh air. So thanks, Julianne. Love it. Hey, um, Laura, in, in Albuquerque, we've taken a cautious approach here with the wheat. The mayor's taken a pretty cautious approach uh, to the situation. We had our own situation. Someone got shot at our own statue down here. Any sense of where the, where the city should be currently on this idea? We've also got a group, it's not quite the same as called uh, uh, in Santa Fe, but there's another group looking to get some dialogue started that's under the mayor's idea here too. Is it gonna take dialogue or something more than that? 
Well, it's definitely going to take a lot more dialogue. You know, it's interesting mm -hmm. to hear um, Tom's comment about how there needs to be more, um, you know, more discussion. There's more discussion to be had, and I, I agree with that. But, you know, so much of this is cultural and, and mixed in with race identity and race relations. Um, you know, the whole discussion reminds me of a book that was published by um, one of my friends and mentors, who is actually one of my law professors, um, Laura Gomez. She was a professor of law also for a while at UNM is now back at UCLA. When I, when I first met her, I was a student there. And she published a book called Manifest Destinies, The Making of the Mexican-American Race, where she talks about some of the racial identity issues in Northern New Mexico and, yeah. and really sort of the way that, that the Mexican race developed in New Mexico specifically. It's very interesting because, um, you know, even when I grew up in Southern New Mexico, um, you know, everyone was Mexican. The word Mexican wasn't a bad word when culturally, when you move to Northern New Mexico, when I moved to Albuquerque actually, and I referred to myself as Mexican, that was seen as like, oh no, you're not Mexican, you're Hispanic, which was funny to have, you know, white people telling me that <laughs> as if it was a bad word or something. Um, but there's a long history of race issues and racial identity that is behind that sort of um, mixed messaging to people who aren't part of, culturally part of these groups. So I'm not surprised to see that 69% of the people polled in Northern New Mexico opposed changing uh, the status quo and the idea that, that these statues should be removed, mainly because to them, this is a source of pride. There's been a long history of um, instilling in them this, uh, this oral tradition, if, if, you know, for lack of a better term, I'm not sure if it was actually taught in school, but it's certainly a very strong oral tradition that they're Spanish, that, right. you know, it came from Spain and all of that. And so there's going to be a lot of pushback to statues of um, conquistadors coming down, you know, and then you juxtapose that with um, the native cultures um, that see that as really oppression and, um, you know, killing. And it's a, it's a symbol of, of just very terrible things that happen to their people. So it's going to take quite a bit of discussion. I agree with Tom. Um, but I don't know that there's going to be a lot of minds to be changed in northern New Mexico. And so I think it's important that there be public input. And one of the biggest concerns that people have in Santa Fe, for example, there was a vigil held um, last week, I believe, on this issue, is that they feel like there it hasn't been enough public input That's when right. some of these issues are removed. Mm -hmm. But I should mention it's called the Race, History and Healing Project from Councillor Clarissa Pena. That's what's going down here. Apologize to the council there. We'll have to leave it there this week. Thanks to all for our panelists and digging in and offering their opinions. We keep using the metaphor Wild West just because there's still so much that you would expect from a business. You would expect like having standardization of your product. You would expect to have just more things in place in terms of a regulatory structure. And it's just, it's not. <laughs> Reverend William Barber II has spent most of his six decades on earth arguing for justice, racial and otherwise. Drawing on an idea first birthed by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Barber revived the Poor People's Campaign, calling America's staggering poverty numbers a moral problem that deserves our attention. Correspondent Russ Conchura spoke with the Reverend recently about what's missing from the conversation about poverty. Reverend Barb, thank you for joining us here on New Mexico in Focus. We appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much for having me here. Sure. You are involved in the Poor People's Campaign. This is a, um, influenced by Dr. King's last efforts in 1968. But you're doing a little differently, um, doing a sustainable um, campaign to tackle poverty. Why is this campaign important for places like New Mexico and Mississippi, some of the poorest states in the Union? First of all, um, Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, does in fact borrow from some of the legacy of Dr. King, the work that he and Cesar Chavez and Jewish Federation and um, uh, the welfare rights women were doing uh, when he decided, and it was very clear that there were three interlocking evils, poverty, racism, and, and militarism that America had to deal with. And as he said, if she didn't, uh, America may very well go to hell. That was his last sermon that he was going to preach before he was assassinated. Uh, we also borrow from the second reconstruction movement right after slavery, when black and white people came together, poor whites and blacks to say we had, they had to turn around 
the country by changing the reality in the South. Today, um, the Poor People's Campaign, that's the call for more revival, is of, 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 of grave importance. Um, when you look at, you just said New Mexico and Mississippi, and you look at those poverty numbers uh, and how high and how equally high they are, even though one is New Mexico and another one is Mississippi. Um, when you look at the reality uh, we have before COVID, 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country, 43% of the nation, 38 million children, 66 million white people, 26 million black people, 61% of the black people are poor and low wealth. That's what that 26 million represents. Then on top of that are 62 million people uh, who get up every morning and buy unleaded gas, can't buy unleaded water. And then you look at the reality that we have had before COVID, 87 million people uninsured or uninsured. Now, after COVID, we're talking about 30 million people who are uh, unemployed. We're headed toward post 50%, plus 50% of the population being in poverty or low wealth, low income. We're talking about another 27 million people added to the 87 million people uninsured or underinsured who have lost their insurance because they lost their jobs. We're headed toward a great destruction, not a great depression. And we cannot merely go back to where we were before COVID. That, that is not good language because before COVID, we had 700 people dying a day from poverty and low wealth. Now we have another thousand dying from COVID. Poverty is a central issue. It is an issue that crosses the lines of race and color and sexuality. It is an issue that this um, nation must face. It is an issue until we face it, we're gonna have these ebbs and flows in our economic uh, reality. It is an issue because no matter how good Wall Street is doing among the one in top 1% and 10%, it has absolutely nothing to do with where poor and low wealth people are in this country. And I believe that if we don't address, and we believe systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, a war economy, uh, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism, that we are actually undermining the very future of this democracy. One of the things that you um, tried to do as part of the Poor People's Campaign and uh, your groups is to bring the issue of poverty into the discussion of the 2020 election. Here in New Mexico, we have a Senate race and a very competitive race, a congressional race in the South. Why is it that you believe poverty should be on the agenda during these elections? My question is, how can it not be? That's what we have said to, um, that's what we have said to candidates that are here. How in the world can you choose not to uh, address an issue that's affecting almost 43% of the nation? When you look at the numbers, it's in the, you know, the millions of people that are poor and low wealth just in Mississippi and in New Mexico. I mean, how, how can you not address an issue where, for instance, if you just pay people a living wage, $15 an hour, you could uh, bring 49 million people out of poverty and put $368 million, $330 million, a billion dollars into the economy. Now, we are always talking about tax cuts is the way to do it. We know that's voodoo economics, give to the top and never trickles down. But you know that if you pay a living wages, that money is going to go into the economy and it's going to build people up and it's going to help the whole economy. It is actually uh, constitutionally inconsistent, morally indefensible and economically insane not to address the issue of poverty and low wealth. Uh, no nation can ignore a reality that's impacting 43% of its people. And I just want to keep driving that home. When you look at the supplemental rate and look at poverty, not the, just the old way of doing it, the, this 55 years old measurement that basically says, if you make $12,000 a year, you're not poor. Well, we know that's not true. Uh, but if you look at the supplemental rate, you come away with 140 million people. For too long, for 50 years now, we have driven the issue of poverty out of the public debates. Uh, we have either, as Republicans, have racialized poverty, or we have seen where Democrats have run from poverty. They talk about it, but they talk about it so metaphorically. You know, they talk about things like people trying to get into the middle class. Well, some people are just trying to make it every day in the wealthiest society in this in the world. So... 
I don't believe that anybody that's serious about leading this country can ignore the reality that what people were facing before COVID and that has only been exacerbated from COVID. COVID has actually ta taught us that poverty and racism are matters of national security. Imagine if, if in this country before COVID, people had made a living wage. They would have some disposable income. They could have stayed out of work. Imagine if people had had health care attached to their body and their humanity, not to their job. You know, but instead, we don't we didn't have those things. So the virus exploits racism and poverty. Then when we pass a CARES Act, 83 percent of all that money goes to corporations and banks. Now we turn around and have to pass another act that we can't get out of, uh, of the Senate. While 30 million people are out of unemployment, 30 something million people face eviction. You just, COVID is making us realize and has brought to the surface that not addressing poverty and racism is a matter of national security. One of the things that I always remember in, in catechism classes was the Gospel of Luke, you know, blessed are the poor, woe to the rich. You bring that as an issue it's to show like poverty is a, can be a spiritual issue to be addressed. But even then, some religious leaders will point to another gospel to say, no, it's, you know, um, blessed are the poor in spirit. We can almost have two different conversations about poverty based on someone's political beliefs, set of facts. How can we have a better community discussion around poverty that eliminates people's differences and say, we need to address, here are the facts, people are struggling, let's have an honest discussion. How can we have a better community conversation around that? One of the things we have to do is, first of all, just agree on some basic fundamental orthodox religiosity and Christianity, because it's been so distorted. And this didn't, didn't just start. You know, slave master religion distorted the gospel. The religion uh, that, that was developed by corporations with religionists to try to stop the New Deal has distorted the gospel. The moral majority distorted the gospel. White evangelicalism, what one of my professors called American Hannity, distorted the gospel. Here's the gospel. There are more than 2,000 scriptures in the Bible that says nations will be judged basically by how they treat the poor, the stranger, the immigrant, and the least of these. Jesus opened his, his uh, uh, ministry by talking about, bless, uh, I've come to preach good news to the poor. And the word there for poor is patokos. It means those who've been made poor by economic injustice. That is just a fact. <laughs> It's indisputable. Jesus opens his ministry and begins his ministry. We're talking about the poor and the least of these. He says, uh, he says the nation will literally be judged by how it treats the least of these. So we have to at least come to terms with the fact that anyone who tries to talk it away, tries to say it shouldn't be a major moral issue from a religious standpoint, is just participating really in a modern day form of heresy. Uh, that, and you have to call it what it is. Secondly, uh, in our Constitution, we say that the first principle of that Constitution is the establishment of justice. And then we say something about promoting the general welfare. Well, you can't establish justice and promote the general welfare if you're not addressing an issue that's facing 140 million people, 43% of the country. So we have to, first of all, just decide that it is a form of democratic malpractice not to address the issue of poverty, both constitutionally and religiously and morally. Then secondly, we have to change the narrative by putting a face on the numbers. That's why the Poor People's Campaign travels to all of these communities, New Mexico, Alabama, and we put a face on the number so that people can't just dismiss it anymore as just numbers. We show the white farmers in Kansas struggling with poverty, just like black fast food workers in North Carolina. We show people in Alabama who are connecting now to people in Appalachia, and they are seeing how poverty and these other interlocking injustices are impacting them. So you got to put a face on it. Then last, then next, you have to destroy the mythology that we don't have the money. We don't have the money. Well, COVID is how to help do that because we found all these trillions of dollars suddenly for corporations. So nobody can say anymore that we don't have the money. We can't find the money. We found $3 trillion for corporations seeming like almost overnight. Uh, a, a trillion and a half went through the treasury. It didn't even come through the legislature. They said, we're going to make it happen. And then we have to build the power. We're going to, in order for this conversation to push, 
poor people have to show their power, which is why we're organizing and registering poor people to vote because they now represent 25% of the electorate. What would you like to see both President Donald Trump and Democratic nominee Joe Biden say during the debates to address poverty? If, if this is a perfect world, what kind of questions should the moderators be asking to bring the issue of poverty into this presidential campaign? Well, I wanted to pull this up. That's why I was just reaching for. One of the things I want them to acknowledge these numbers. So let's take, for instance, Mexico. They want votes in Mexico. 49% of the people in Mexico are poor and low income. That's a million people. 58% of all the children, 49% of women, 58% of people of color, 35% people that are white in New Mexico are poor and low wealth. In New Mexico, you've got 230,000 people that are uninsured. 2,000. So first of all, you, I want them to acknowledge the numbers and the people represented by the numbers. And then I want them to say how they will address these five interlocking injustices, systemic racism and all of its reality, the police violence, yes, but also voter suppression, also continuing uh, 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 underfunding and resegregation of public schools and mass incarceration and the mistreatment of our immigrant brothers and sisters, Latino brothers and sisters, our mistreatment of indigenous brothers and sisters, but then also address poverty and the lack of living wages and ecological devastation. They have to address the issues, not talk around them, not just just, um, uh, uh, you know, come up with nice metaphors. We ought to be concerned. We want people to have, you know, have the opportunity. What does that mean specifically? How will your campaign specifically? Now, we've actually invited them on September the 14th to become individuals, not a debate, to come before our um, uh, unleashing, voting is, voting is power unleashed, Moral Monday, Poor People's Campaign is putting on inviting Thousands and thousands of thousands of people, that, uh, of the three million people that joined us on June 20th for the Mass Poor People's Assembly, to come back to be trained in voter protection and voter participation. And we've had, we've invited Trump and Biden to come and each take seven minutes and talk to poor and low wealth people and say, "Listen, what is well, here's here's my agenda. This is how it's going to impact all people, especially poor and low wealth people." Now, what else we're going to do, though, is we recognize that in any election, you have to make a choice, a practical choice. So poor and low wealth people are saying we're going to evaluate candidates. Then we're going to see who's closest to our agenda. We're going to vote for them. It's not about partisan. It's about practical voting. And then after the election, we're going to push them. You know, I wish that the media would decide that they're going to have one debate on nothing but poverty. On what's what's affecting 50 percent of this nation. And then, and then have the questions come from poor and low wealth people. So it can't be something that folks skate around and go to the heart of the matter. And they have to talk about that. What are you, where, where do you stand on living wages? Where do you stand on adequate safety nets? And I wish the media and others would not let people call it socialism because it is not socialism to make sure people have a living wage and make sure people have health care and make sure people have fundamental education. It's genuine democracy. It's not socialism. What is socialism is giving all this money to the corporations, <laughs> free money to corporations that just use that money and turn around and then just buy back their own stocks and do not produce jobs and do not produce living wage jobs. That's a form of socialism. But there's no way you can, can say that socialism is uh, saying that a person that works a job will make a living wage. That's not socialism. That's something called right. It's just doing right. It's just doing justice. Dr. King once said, when you don't pay a man a living wage, you are actually, he called it, and, and caused people to face murder, I mean, die, and die, that he called it murder. Coretta Scott King said it's violent when we don't pay people a living wage, when we do not pay people what they deserve. Jesus said, uh, woe unto those, uh, excuse me, the prophet Isaiah said, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their right to make women and children their prey, as Isaiah 10. And so I want to see, we want to see these candidates stop ignoring, stop racializing poverty and acting like it's just black and brown people. When we know that White people, about 31% of white people are poor and low wealth, but that 31% of white people is 40 million more than the total number of black people that are in poverty. 
and then stop running from the issue of poverty. Stop listening to these consultants that tell you poor people don't want to be called poor. We push poor people off the agenda for 50 years, and it's been 50 years too long, and we've got to change that. Reverend, what do you tell activists who are overwhelmed by this poverty, they're overwhelmed by this injustice? What do you tell them to keep giving them hope to continue? A lot of times, many of these activists and folks struggling with poverty will give up hope. What's the message that you tell them that they cannot give up hope, that they must continue to fight um, these inequalities? Well, the ones that I'm meeting are telling me they can't give up. <laughs> As we move around the country, you know, we're not organized from the top down. See, we every state we went in, New Mexico, we were invited in. They invited us in because when people figure out that they have a right to be, to exist, and then they figure out they've been lied to. As Dr. King said, they, they kept getting a check, come back, mark insufficient funds. When people find, find out they've been lied to, and a lot of people have figured that out during COVID, we've been lied to. Every time, seven months ago, people were telling us we didn't have money to do this, we didn't have money to do this. Well, how did you find all this money all of a sudden? So people are now saying, wait a minute, you've been lying to us. And then when people find out that they've been told that their vote doesn't matter, and they find out, wait a minute, you mean to tell me just 2% of us could change this? 20% could change here? 1% could change here? It, it, it shifts the whole attitude of the battle. And which is why in Kentucky last year, poor and low wealth people came together. They had a mean governor who, who took back their health care, and they came together. They, took, they changed three counties that were formerly Trump counties and put a new governor in place. Never endorsed him. They endorsed issues. He then took up the issues of the Poor People's Campaign. And the night that he was elected, he said, they gave a shout out to the campaign and said, I've learned during this election that some things are not about Democrat versus Republican and left versus right, but right versus wrong. And we believe that's going to start happening all over this country because people cannot continue to, to you know, they cannot continue to suffocate under the knee of police violence, under the knee of racism and under the knee of poverty. There is something in the very inside of our souls that demands we have to fight to breathe. And that's what I think you're seeing in the streets. It's BLM, but I think if people just understand that it's Black Lives Matter, they're missing it. It's people who in the midst of COVID have experienced so much that when George Floyd said, I can't breathe, it was like shorthand for what many people are experiencing. Whether it's that poor worker that's been forced to go to work without the proper equipment, uh, whether it's that person that didn't have sick leave or unemployment, they feel like the weight of the systems are on top of them. And, and what you see in the street is the fight for this democracy to breathe. It is actually the hope of America. People don't understand the protest is the hope. The hope is in the morning because if folk just gave up on this country, you wouldn't see people in the street protesting. You would see something worse in the street. You know, that's why we have to separate the infiltrators doing the violence versus the real nonviolent protesters. But the protest is in itself a sign of hope. It means people do not believe that this democracy is beyond being changed and fixed and being made better. Reverend Barr, thank you for joining us here on New Mexico in Focus. We really appreciate it and we're honored to have you. Thank you so much. Take care now. A lot is on the table when it comes to the legalization of recreational cannabis in New Mexico. Legislators are divided, advocates are frustrated, and some are worried legalization would hurt the medical cannabis program. Growing Forward is a new podcast from NMPBS and the New Mexico Political Report that explores these things and more. NMIF correspondent Bryce Dix sat down with hosts Andy Lyman and Megan Kemrick to talk about what's in store for the podcast that premieres later this month. Megan and Andy, thank you for joining us today. It's nice to see you guys, although over Zoom. Um, so just to get into it, you both are both going to be co-hosting a new podcast that will be premiering on September 29th, and a preview episode will be airing next week. Um, Megan, can you walk me through what the podcast is going to be and what's in store for listeners? Well, Bryce, we wanted to look at um, the evolution of the cannabis industry here in New Mexico, starting with our medical cannabis program um, and how that fostered the development to where we are today. But also, um, Andy has covered this extensively 
for a New Mexico political report, and we know there was a run at legalization in the last session, we're pretty sure that will happen again in the upcoming session, especially because our economy is not doing well, oil and gas not doing well, we don't have a very diverse economic base, and a lot of people are eyeing this as a way to bring in more tax revenue and more jobs. Yeah, and Andy, as Megan said, you've been reporting on cannabis for a while now. Um, what's different now? Why, why did you want to do this podcast in the first place? Um, I think it's it, it's proven so far to be an opportunity to talk about things that don't necessarily fit into the political uh, sphere that I'm used to reporting on. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that's sort of, uh, it, it crosses a lot of sort of journalistic beats. Um, you know, Megan was a, a business reporter, and so she's got a lot of knowledge in that. Um, there, there is a lot of political stuff that we've talked about, but there's also just this, how does it work? How does this program work? What, how do they, um, stuff that I've, I've learned that I didn't know uh, up until this year, you know, how, how banking works, how all this other, uh, you know, uh, we'll hear in the preview episode, uh, this issue of, uh, marijuana being, uh, sort of based in, in racism, the term marijuana versus cannabis. So just, I've learned so much myself in the past few months. And Megan, as Andy said, you're the newcomer to this. You haven't really done much reporting, don't know too, too much, as much as Andy. Um, what are you hoping listeners get out of the podcast? Well, yeah, what, so I was a business reporter here for eight years, but um, that was, I left in 2012. So I, I covered a lot of industries, but I never covered this one. And so I'm hoping I can be a stand-in for some listeners who really don't know much about it either. And so we're a good pairing because Andy's covered it so much. So um, I can bring kind of fresh eyes to what is, uh, I keep being surprised every time we have an interview um, that even though it's been around for a while and we've had a medical program, it's still, uh, we keep using the metaphor of wild west just because there's still so much that you would expect from a business. You would expect like having standardization of your product you would expect to have just more things in place in terms of a regulatory structure and it's just it's not <laughs> it's really one reason is because it's still illegal at the federal level but all these states have started to carve their own way as new mexico is and so i'm hoping we can inform people give them a little bit more nuance and context if they don't know anything about it but just how interesting it is and how many different kinds of people are involved in it yeah, and Andy, as the as the veteran reporter here on cannabis, I'm curious myself, what's something new that you've learned and something that might have surprised you in doing this podcast, these 10 episodes of this podcast? I think a, a lot of stuff. Uh, I think there's some preconceived notions of who is a cannabis user. Uh, you know, we, we just recently spoke to uh, some folks who don't fit that mold of, you know, left leaning sort of uh, hippie pot smokers. Um, we've learned a lot about the banking system. Um, there's issues with testing that I didn't really get to dive in too much. Uh, regulation, education. Uh, I, I, I've actually learned so much and actually it's been helpful to have Megan ask those questions that I've never thought of without having the fresh eyes that she was talking about. So it's it's been a pretty fun experience to to go through all of this and, and what about you megan anything new or interesting that surprised you uh like every interview i did bryce something surprised me one thing i never thought about there's a woman we interviewed we'll be talking to about um there's no education program really for the people you walk into a dispensary you're like maybe you have your medical card obviously right now um and you have an issue and you're like, I want to use cannabis for whatever, my back pain, my knee, you know, whatever the medical program covers. And you're looking to this person like, so what should I do? Because there's like all these strains, there's all these different ways to consume it. I would want that person to be super knowledgeable. And one thing this person we interviewed pointed out, like, well, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. <laughs> so she's working on creating an educational curriculum to do that like anyone would have in like real estate or um in pharmacies or uh, in any industry you can think of I'm like oh we don't have that yet okay mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's really okay. interesting Sounds very very interesting we have about 30 seconds left andy where can we find the podcast once it's released 
Uh, we have it up on Anchor. You can go to New Mexico Political Report. We have a link there. You can go to New Mexico PBS and find it there. And I think you'd be able to find it anywhere uh, you generally get your podcasts. Uh, and I, I, it sounds like our first episode will be ready to, or a preview episode will be ready to run uh, September 22nd. Andy Lyman and Megan Kamrick are co-hosts of Growing Forward. The podcast will premiere September 29th. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot, Bryce. The story and conversation regarding migratory birds and why they're dying across our state seems to have touched a nerve with a lot of us. Hey, we notice these things living in New Mexico. The rhythm of life is outside our windows for the viewing every day. Now, while we don't know definitively why these birds are dying, we could all do our part in finding a solution. Keep an eye out. Watch your cats. If you find a dead bird on your property, you can take pictures with the app mentioned in Laura's interview. And another tip of the hat to Algernon Damasa at the Las Cruces Sun News for the original reporting. Thanks again for joining us and for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you.